this has a timer on it, good. So I will try to also stick by time. Um, I am Jeff Klon, for anyone who doesn't know me. I'm one of the I2B2 guys, <laughs> along with Mike Mendez and Sean Murphy are probably the, the core people that are doing this from MGB right now and maintaining the core software. Um, so what is the I2B2 core software? Uh, because there are a lot of things that we've talked about today that are I2B2. Um, people are doing a lot of amazing things with it. The core software is the Java server, the data model, um, and the web, the web client interface. And uh, we, as this small group that manages the core software, um, handle uh, the core software features that we focus on maintaining and adding any features that really need to go out to the whole community, as well as documentation, web presence, bundling things. Um, I, I'm going to review a few links that people ought to know, um, because I'm sure some people here are new to ITB2. Um, bear with me if you already know all these things. If you want information on ITB2, go to community.itb2.org. That's we reorganized it over the last four years or so, so everything can be get gotten to from there. The links to the demo of the web client are there. The uh, release notes for the new software, um, documentation on the data model, uh, work that we've been doing with Dell on, um, <clears throat> on bundles are all there. Um, we also have a, a great mailing list, which is still called ITV2 Install Help, but is really a list for any hard questions you have about ITV2, um, about security considerations around SAML or bugs in the web client, or um, <clears throat> how to implement ITV2 uh, with uh, unusual data sets. Uh, and also some of the things that are here are bundle documentation, data model documentation, but I won't, I won't belabor that, <clears throat> but definitely check out those two resources. If you're a developer, also check out our GitHub, github.com slash i2b2. That is the source code. Um, you can download the software itself from the main page, and uh, there's a Jira where you can submit issues if you have a feature request or something's wrong with i2b2. Um, I, I probably ought to here somewhere have mentioned uh, Docker. We also have two different Docker um, <clears throat> images on ITB2 right now, one developed by uh, Kevin Dew at Pitt and one developed by uh, Kavi Waikolikar uh, over, uh, over near us. And uh, those, those are, are great ways to spin up ITB2 quickly. Um, things that have happened with ITB2 core software since the beginning of the pandemic Right at the beginning of it, we released uh, 1.7.12 and then an update to it. And then we rolled it out to ACT, the data network, and we documented some important things. And that was the current state of things until the summer we released um, 13, 1.7.13. Uh, the next release, we're planning to call 1.8, just to break the 1.7. cycle. Um, and because we'll be bundling the new user interface with it, so that feels like a big change. Um, pause for a second. I'm just curious, how many people out there are using ITB2 1.7.12? Okay, and how about 1.7.13? Anyone? Okay, and then an earlier version of ITB2, any earlier version? Just Aaron. <laughs> oh, and Michelle, okay. <laughs> oh, you're Paul Bay. All right, so a lot of adoption of 12A. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about 13 here, uh, and focus on that for five minutes, and then try to encourage you to, to play with it and try it out. Uh, things that we did in 12, this is a little bit old news now, but just to reiterate real quick, things that you, could, you might like about 12 if you haven't tried it yet, it's much easier to install now. Uh, you can probably do it. We have a quick install guide. You can probably do it in 10 minutes. If you know, not to roll out to your enterprise, but just to try it out. Uh, REDCap integration, like actual linkage of a, of a live REDCap form submission to an I2B2 instance, improved UI layout, and we, we really focused on improving the find terms interface so you can find things much more easily now. And that was, um, that was something that uh, we, we worked with, uh, with the UI working group and uh, and some of the interfaces they were looking at from other institutions, um, especially LEAF from VW. And we kind of model our, our new approach based on that. So 1.7.13, the exciting thing that we worked on during the first phase of the pandemic and have released this summer. Uh, the thing that we, we spent probably the most effort on 
is a SAML authentication and a user account registration tool that kind of ties in with that. And that was that was enabled by a partnership with with our friends at, at Pitt and our Pitt colleagues. Uh, Kevin in particular did a lot of the a lot of the software development for that. Um, there's also a new version of the ACT ontology. We've been bundling that with ITBT for a couple of releases. Um, is it's you know it's it's modern. It's updated regularly. It's a great ontology. So in addition to the demo ontology, which has been around for a decade or so, you can install the ACT before ontology. We have really focused on trying to enhance the security of I2B2. There was concern about log4j that maybe people who are technical have heard about. Um, I2B2 did not actually have a vulnerability with log4j, but uh, there were libraries that were used that obviously did have security vulnerabilities. Just the way it was used in I2B2 didn't. But we've upgraded, done a whole upgrade on log4j to, to a new release. Um, uh, we also do a lot, I, I do a lot with patient counting scripts um, to kind of characterize your data. And we're going to talk more about that in the Enact session tomorrow. So uh, don't, don't go home after, after Mike's thing. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, yeah, 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 well, I'm just going to leave this, uh, talk about it tomorrow. But it, it, it's, a, it's a nice way to characterize your data. Um, for those who don't know, all of our new documentation for new releases is in the release notes. So we do try to update the core documentation that's throughout the community wiki. But if you really want to know what the new features are, you have to look at it by release right now. So that, that's been true since at least 1.7.10. Um, so if you want information on what's new in 1.7.13, go to the release notes. And there's a little, there's a link here on the home page. Um, you click on release notes or uh, or you can, you know, there's a, there are links on, prominently also on the main wiki page. And uh, fr from that page, you can get to a lot of detailed documentation, including updates to the install guide on the main wiki uh, th about SAML. <clears throat> uh, again, in this release, uh, I want to highlight that we do, you know, we maintain the core software, but we, uh, we're a small group. We need your help. So we definitely encourage uh, collaborations and um, even you know submissions of features that people have developed at other institutions. So people submit pull requests on the GitHub of things that they've developed, and we actively look at those and um, incorporate the ones that we can into the core software. If, if you do submit a pull request and we don't get get in touch with you, then drop us a email or a message to the install group so we actually so we actually do see it. Um, but as I said, the SAML stuff and user account was a collaboration with, with Pitt and also UW. Um, Act Ontology before comes from Pitt. Uh, and then we had some performance improvements and bug fixes and API improvements. So we had Kentucky and Colorado and Pitt and Wake Forest all involved in, in making those changes. So it, it continues to be an active community, uh, enhancing even the core software, which I, I'm excited about. Uh, so. I'm going to talk maybe in more detail than people want about SAML. I'll, I'll try to make this quick, but I wanted to go through it a little bit because as the show of hands has showed that no one's using 13 yet, and I, that's the impression I've gotten to from, from the forums. Um, and uh, we know that you know, from surveying sites, there are sites that really need uh, like integrated authentication with their enterprise, and that's why we you know, made this a priority feature. So I'm hoping that people will try it out and let us know if there are problems and things that need to be changed. Um, so the architecture diagram is a user hits the web client with their web browser. And then instead of logging you in directly, it redirects you to your institution's identity provider. That's the SAML term for it, where you get some kind of like, you know, MGB Okta or PIT password. And you type in your username and log in. And then you're logged in by the institution. And then your credentials are you know, verified in a way that is probably more, <clears throat> more robust than using just the ITP2 user tables. And then a, um, there's a proxy on the web client that then communicates over uh, AJP to the Wildfly server. And I don't know if this crowd wants to know about AJP. There was a question on the user group list about um, why AJP and uh, our security expert at UW suggested it, um, it but it, it because it is very a very good protocol for securely transferring um, SAML information in the headers. 
of the message that can't be hacked, but it all does have to be run in a secure environment within your firewall. And you, to really do this, you need to run the web client and the wildfly on the same server, or, um, or, or at least have the proxy running on the same server and able to communicate to it via Apache. So uh, questions about that, talk to me or Kevin or Mike, um, and we'd, we'd love to help you uh, work, through, work through how you're feeling about that, or concerns you have. Um, yeah, go past that. So I, I did make a tiny screencast. This is uh, button, button. Okay. So this is login in the new IT in the current IT. This is not the new user interface that Nick was demoing, but this is this is what we've got right now. So this is local. You choose local. You log in like you always do. Um, you can also set up a domain, and this is a domain in the ITB2 configuration sense that lets you log in via SAML. Um, and that, that redirects you to your identity provider. This is an example identity provider uh, called um, Simple SAML PHP. But, uh, but this, in reality, this would redirect you to your real identity provider, do an institutional login, and then you're in ITB2 for your institutional login. And then I, I think one of the neat things about this is that I was trying to refresh the page. I hit the wrong button. But if you refresh the page, you're still logged in. And that's been an annoyance at ITB2 for a while. You have to re-log in when you refresh. So this this keeps you this keeps you this keeps you in there. I, I, I'm, I'm glad that I'm not the only one who thinks that's fun. Um, all right. I have oh I still have like four three three or four minutes left. Um, the, the user registration tool is an add-on that put into the web client. But it, it kind of dovetails really well with the, with the SAML authentication, or at least that's, that's our thought. You can set up the user registration so it doesn't appear, uh, so it appears for SAML registrations and or so it appears for local registrations. If you use it for SAML, which in parlance, I guess, is federated mode, then uh, you can click, when you click the little sign up link, it takes you to a dialog box that says, oh, log in with your institutional provider, and then it'll send you back with a dialog saying, OK, you're signed up, and the administrator will be in touch with you. And what that actually does is it creates an ITB2 user for that SAML user and links it to that SAML authentication. But that user has no permissions to do anything. Uh, can't get to any projects, can't even log in. Um, and then the administrator can go back and review those and give them access. So it makes it just a little bit uh, more it, it, it makes it a little simpler for administrators to maintain accounts, or at least that's what we hope. Uh, you can also do this locally. Uh, and that it, th then anyone inside your firewall could potentially create an ITB2 account, but they won't have any access to anything. So um, might also be a good option for some people. All right, in my last minute and a half, uh, 1.7.14 slash probably 1.8 uh, is going to be bundled with the new UI that we heard about and Apama and Nick talk about. We're going to add ITB2 on OMOP support. This, for people who know ITB2, this isn't a new thing. Um, uh, work led by Lori Phillips was done like four years ago or so to, to, do the, to demonstrate that this could work. We're, our goal here is to harden it, make it faster, make it easier to implement on your I2B2. So you'll be able to use the I2B2 clients and tools to query your OMOP database directly and not without ETLing it into I2B2. So that's also an option. And that uses a version of the I2B2 ontology for ACT that Michelle is maintaining that has OMOP codes behind it, which is um, just a lot of work <laughs> for her. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, another, other things that we're working on is doing some stuff with data export. Um, I think Mike will talk about that a bit in the ETL group tomorrow. Um, and it's, it's still in its nascent stages, so I'm not going to you know, present on it, but it'd be good to get people involved in that discussion. And uh, also, we're thinking of including some, a lot of what we're thinking about in ITB2 these days is uh, derived facts, uh, information that you can derive from, from data in ITB2, but isn't obvious from the ITB2 data. So like COVID severity would be an example of that. Um, loyalty score, which I think Sean touched on earlier. Um, and patient counts, which is an easy thing to think of for uh, for data, data quality and phenotypes. So things like things like this can be um, fed back into I2B2. So you can store 
you can do this live at query time, but you can also store uh, like a loyalty score or a count of patients or um, uh, phenotypic information in your ITV2 fact table or in a secondary fact table even, and then access that quickly at query time and, and for analytics. And so we're thinking about ways to make that easier and um, I'm gonna touch on that a little bit in the act, in act session tomorrow too. Uh, so a reminder, you can all distribute, contribute features. We like pull requests. Um, you can, I, I, th these other bullets are, have been here for a while. So there's, there's also room to clean up the community projects or improve the documentation if you're not a developer and you still want to contribute. Um, this is, I have two acknowledgement slides. They're probably um, not as complete as they ought to be, but this is about 50 of the people who have been involved in ITB2 since the beginning over 15 years ago. Uh, so uh, that's the projects team, and this is the core development team. And um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll leave that up for a second. But I'm one minute over, so thanks, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Yeah, Keith? Yeah, yeah, so it, it, we're gonna... Just gonna repeat the question. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> is the OMOP support going to be version specific for a certain version of OMOP? Um, I'm not sure how flexible we, we can be with subversions, but we're definitely focusing on OMOP 5 and 5.3. And not, we're not thinking about six at this point. Uh, any other questions? Hey, Aaron. No, it'll go into, it'll probably go into a secondary fact table. We, we're thinking of doing this with like a, the multi-fact setup, so you know, it'll get derived fact table. Uh, admin, yeah, administrators could create facts and users will be able to query and analyze data. Uh, no, no, administrators will probably create that. So they'll, they'll run the digital twins and create the phenotype uh, facts in the fact table, and then, but that'll be part of the ontology probably, and then users can, researchers can go in and use those phenotypes to, uh, to query the derived facts. Okay, we'll talk more. <laughs> Appreciate that. Well, that's a hard question. <laughs> we, we did the SAML, but the, yeah, I, I honestly don't have a roadmap in my mind for that. I'm not sure if Nick has thought about that at all in his reimagination of the web client. Yeah. Okay, so we know it's important. <laughs> oh, the question that Nick just, yeah, so the inter, they were asking, Mark was asking about the internationalization of the web client so it can support other languages. And Nick was saying that in the new UI, he recognizes that's important. The map to doing that hasn't been planned out yet.
So, so SAML projects are, our user projects are still managed by I2B2. So a SAML user is associated with an I2B2 user. And that I2B2 user, you can assign specific projects that they can access and levels of access that they can have for those projects. Does that answer your question? Kind of? Yeah. OK, let's, let's talk more. Uh, I, I don't believe the SAML supports Active Directory. There is, I believe, one of the contributions to I2B2 had a bit of Active Directory stuff in there, but I'm not completely familiar with what that was. Oh, okay, so Mike's saying Active Directory is NTLM, and we, we, we have supported NTLM and NTLM2 for a while. I, I couldn't quite hear the question. Is someone? Oh, oh, the the new UI, particularly and the temporal query. Yeah, I should really give that question to Nick since he's doing the new UI. <laughs> yeah, you can. You can. Do those work? Nope. No. So uh, we do have uh, some design for a simple temporal temporal query which is uh, the way that they're doing it on Shrine. Uh, Shrine's uh, advancing their user interface, making it a little bit more complex. And we're looking at perhaps having just a very simple uh, temporal query that you can run natively and then just have a plugin developed that gives you the full set of functionality and gives you every ability that I2B2 is going to give you on the back end. There'll be a demo in a few minutes of what Shrine does. We're going to be trying to do what Shrine does. So. All right, any, any other questions? All right, well, thank you, appreciate it.